Hello, everybody, and welcome once again to our series of conversations between Caleb Morpin and Rapal Bra. I'm Jyoti Bra, and today we are going to be talking about Trotsky and Trotskyism. Um, this is a, a topic that if you're active in the left-wing movement or if you have studied any Russian history in school, you will not have been able to avoid. In fact, I first came across Trotsky, the mention of Trotsky, when I was reading Animal Farm in English literature at school age 15. And uh, it turned out, we were told, Animal Farm is an allegory for Soviet history. And the nice pig is Trotsky and the horrible pig is Stalin. Uh, and if you want to know more about what I think about that, one of the first things I ever wrote was a little pamphlet on George Orwell and how much of an anti-communist he was. But moving on from that, you know, the view of Trotsky as the real inheritor of Lenin's revolutionary spirit, the real leader in waiting of the Soviet Union, the true power behind the Bolshevik revolution and many other myths are propagated at, at us endlessly in the West. So I'd like us to divide our talk today, if we can, uh, into two strands. And first of all, we'll talk about Trotsky the man, and then we'll talk about Trotskyism, the post-World War II movement. Uh, I hope that makes sense. So first, I'm going to ask you, Harpal, to tell us a little bit about Trotsky the man and what, why he is mythologized so much in the West and what's the truth behind the mythology, if you could. Well, the truth behind the mythology is that he spent 14 whole years from 1903 to 1914 opposing the Bolsheviks, opposing Lenin, trying to prevent them building a truly proletarian party, revolutionary party that could take lead of the masses and bring about, about, a, about a revolution. He spent all those uh, 13 years after 1914 doing ju ju just that. So that is enough for him to qualify as the darling of the petty bourgeois left as well as the darling of the imperialist, the bourgeoisie. You see, with imperialists, Trotsky himself would not be popular. But when they see there's a rotten left winger and a revolutionary left winger, they always go for the rotten. And Trotsky was a rotten left left winger. Trotsky had a good turn of phrase. He was a good orator. And he uh, uh, used, used Marxist terminology to cover his retreat from Marxism, to cover his retreat from revolutionary ide ideology and basically on every single point he was wrong he, he was wrong and that th and he was a po po poser you know who liked to stand in front of, of of crowds as lenin once said by way of a job trotsky is behaving like the schoolboy he was when he used to appear in all his glare before high, high, high class students because he took part in dra drama and that sort of thing. I mean, he, he literally was, was a poser. And our spy, spy Sir Robert Bruce Brookhart, who had been sent by the British government after the October Revolution to cause dissension among the Bolsheviks and see if by that dissension they could not overthrow the newly established Bolshevik regime. They pinned their hopes on Trotsky and having stayed several months in Soviet Russia, um, Sir Robert wrote back to the British government, I have met no one who does, among the higher leadership who does not consider himself either superior or equal to Trotsky. And I've met no one who does, does not regard Lenin as a god, god, god. There's no chance of being able to mobilize Trotsky against Lenin. It's an enterprise that, that's, that's, that's bound to fail. And that's the reason for his, his uh, popularity with, with the bourgeoisie. But we can come to specific points. He was against the building of socialism in the Soviet, Soviet Union. He was against the victory of the Soviet Union against the, 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 the Nazis. He, he was on every point, basically, opposed the Bolshevik party's revolutionary program. Isaac Deutscher quite rightly said, and Isaac Deutscher is a doting Trotskyite who loves Trotsky, praises Trotsky, and who 
and never, never misses an opportunity to say what a dull, manipulating uh, person Stalin was. And yet, if you have finished reading his biography from beginning to end, Stalin grows up to be a giant. And if you read Deutsch's trilogy on Trotsky, at the end of it, he comes out such a puny person, vindictive, you know, opposing all, all before it, saying, you know, we old Bolsheviks are inclined to dege degenerate. There is a danger of degeneration. And Stalin, Stalin replied at a party congress, I like the, the spirit of self-sacrifice that Trotsky has shown, but I must rescue Trotsky from Trotsky. He cannot be included among those Bolsheviks, old Bolsheviks who will degenerate for the obvious reason he's not an old Bolshevik. He did not join us until two or three months before the revolution. So that, that was what Trotsky was. Thank you. Caleb, would you like to add to that? Yes. Um, I'll just add that, you know, when Trotsky did join the Bolsheviks in July of 1917, he said that he officially repudiated everything that came before that, all the decades of disagreement with Lenin and all of that. However, if you look at Trotsky's life afterwards, he continued those politics. There is a continuity. The basis of Trotskyism is that in 1903, Lenin formed a party of new type. He formed the Bolshevik party. And he said, we need a, a revolutionary party a new type of political party so we can move toward taking power. We need to form a party of new type. We need to break with social democracy. And Trotsky rejected that. And instead, he said that they could form something called the August Bloc, which would be a more radical faction of the reformist social democrats. Uh, and that politics is consistent with Trotsky throughout the rest of his life. After he broke with uh, with the Soviet Union and the Communist International, what did his followers do? They formed the Fourth International, and then they joined the Social Democratic parties and formed, tried to form radical factions in them. They call it the, the French Turn. Uh, they call it entryism in Britain. They're in the Labour Party. Uh, you know, in in the United States, they're they're always trying to you know you know co coordinate somehow with the Socialist Party of the United States, and that that that. The idea that they can be the more radical faction of European social democracy, that's really foundational to Trotskyism. And then from there, you have the theory of permanent revolution, the idea that the only hope for socialism is in the West, in the Western capitalist centers. And so if you have a, a socialist revolution in a country like Russia or China or Vietnam or Cuba, it's really hopeless uh, because those countries have too many peasants and peasants are a hopeless reactionary class. All that really revolution to the West, which Trotsky loved. He loved the West. Uh, and he said that the United States, in particular New York City, was the foundry where the fate of mankind will be forged. It's all about the West. Uh, I think there's some of the far right groups in the United States. They will chant the West is the best. Well, that's what Trotsky thought. The West is the best. Uh, and he particularly hated the peasantry. Uh, he particularly hated the, you know, the Russian peasantry uh, as somebody from Ukraine, as someone who experienced anti-Semitic discrimination at the hands of the Russian peasantry. Uh, and he very much was uh, 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 from that school. Now, what's also interesting is that Trotsky spent most of his life in exile. And um, I recall at the time of the Russian Revolution, I remember looking back at old newspapers like the New York Times and all of that. Lenin was relatively unknown to the Western media. But they knew Trotsky and they blamed Trotsky for the Russian Revolution because he'd spent his life in New York City and Paris and London and Vienna as this well-known intellectual who was talking about being the great Russian revolutionary. And uh, the Bolsheviks, on the other hand, people didn't know about the Bolsheviks until they took power. People, you know, the Western press was like, who are they? Who are these people? But they knew Trotsky. So, uh, yeah, that's that's kind of my view of Trotsky. Trotskyism was an attempt to not adopt Lenin and Leninism. It was attempt to, an attempt to hold on to uh, to European social democracy. Uh, it, it was a middle class trend. We can talk more about it. Um, but yeah, th those are my initial thoughts. Beautiful. Thanks, Caleb. You know, the things that strike me listening to you guys that, that kind of jump out at me. Uh, number one, Trotsky as an individual, uh, his egotism, 
was was noted by everybody who mixed with him. I can't remember who it was. It might have been Arthur Ransom or it might have been John, um, the 10 Days Who Shook the World guy. Um, one of them, during the time of the October Revolution, watching Trotsky said, this guy would die for the revolution as long as there was a big enough audience to watch him do it, right? That, that was how he kind of summed up Trotsky's personality, you know, that he was totally egotistical, that he, he could never kind of get over the fact that he wasn't number one because he, in his mind, he was number one, right? Um, his phraseology was very ultra left, you know, and this characterizes Trotskyism today still, uh, kind of hiding a lot of policies which are actually acceptable to the ruling class behind very revolutionary sounding phrases. Um, and that characterized Trotsky himself as well as Trotskyism. Um, and the other thing is just the fact that actually, you know, when you find out more about Trotsky and his and his policies and his writings over the course of his life, there's a lot of contradiction in there. But the one thing I think that really, and Hapal highlighted it right at the beginning, the one thing that ties it all together is not that he had a coherent worldview, but that he was anti-Lenin, in fact. You know, the Trotskyists hold up Trotsky as the next Lenin and the inheritor of Lenin. But in fact, if you look at Trotsky's life and work, the essence that you can pull out of it is anti-Lenin, anti-Leninism, right? That's the one kind of guiding principle that seems to un underlie it all. Um, Paul Caleb's mentioned quite a few of, of Trotsky's kind of key theoretical contributions, if you like, to the confusion of the working class. Uh, one is the question of the peasantry, uh, one is the, the national question, and the other one is the question of permanent revolution. So I wondered if you'd like to talk a bit about any of those. All of them are tied together. If you ask me to characterize Trotskyism, what characterizes Trotskyism? First of all, is the theory of permanent revolution. That's the hub of everything that you have mentioned. Second is his attitude towards the dictatorship of the broad party of the, of the proletariat and the, and the leadership of the party. And the third one is his, his attitude towards the leaders and institutions of the, of the Bolshevik party. If I may spend a couple of minutes on each of those. The first one, theory of permanent revolution. You must really understand it properly. I mean, the theory of permanent revolution can actually be described as the theory of permanent hopelessness. What it meant was, at the time that Trotsky and Lenin were in, in the movement at the beginning of the 20th century, everybody knew that the then coming revolution in Russia was bourgeois democratic revolution, that this was uh, not a socialist revolution. So the question was, what was to be the attitude of the proletariat towards it? The Mensheviks who split from the Bolsheviks, or the Bolsheviks who split from the Mensheviks as early as 1903 over the question of the membership of the party and what conditions had to be satisfied. And by the way, Trotsky sided with the Mensheviks on, on that. He'd been brought to that conference by Lenin. And as soon as this scoundrel comes, what he does is fights against Lenin over there. So that it's going to be a bourgeois revolution. The Mensheviks believed, yes, it was going to be a Menshevik revolution, sorry, bourgeois revolution. And what will happen after that would be there'll be a long period during which the capitalist class Will establish itself as the ruling class and develop capitalism and at some future date there could be a talk of socialism. Lenin on the other hand believed yes it was going to be a bourgeois democratic revolution but the leadership of the, of the bourgeois democratic revolution must be in the hands of the proletariat because it's proletariat and proletariat alone that is really interested in the outcome of that revolution because the bourgeois revolution would create fertile ground for the development of socialism, propagating among the masses and moving to the next, next stage. In other words, there are stages in the revolution, but stages don't mean that each stage lasts 50 or 100 years. All it depends on the, is on the preparedness of the masses when they're ready to move on to the next, next, next stage. So Trotsky, on the other hand, said, yes, it was a bourgeois revolution, but, you know, sorry, the, the coming revolution must overthrow Tsarism 
autocracy, but it must straight away lead, lead to social, socialism. It was going to be a socialist revolution. So he was actually distinguishing himself from everybody else. And then and quite rightly said, it won't, won't lead to socialism. This revolution will lead to bourgeois democracy, but led by the working class, which would prepare the grounds for the transition of that revolution to a socialist revolution as early as 2003 in his press pamphlet, One Step Forward, Two Steps 19, Back. 1902, maybe. Three, three. Just, uh, just after the second congress of the RSS anyway yeah and he, he made it perfectly clear what, what he was seeking Trotsky on the other hand being the super revolutionary he couldn't bear to say that there were ever intermediate stages in the in the revolutionary process and also the next question was in the coming bourgeois democratic revolution who would be the allies of the proletariat? For the Mensheviks, the point was clear. The bourgeoisie was going to be the allies of the proletariat. For the Bolsheviks, it was going to be the peasantry, which near needed and desired land, who would be the most rely reliable uh, ally of the, of the proletariat, not the bourgeoisie. The bourgeoisie was only fighting for a compromise with Zarevan whereas the peasantry was fighting a life and death struggle for achieving land ownership. And Trotsky, on the other hand, said, we will neither have the bourgeoisie as allies nor the, pe the pe peasantries, but the start of the moment will bring the proletariat into power. But having come to power, it will have to straight away attack private property including small peasant property. And in doing so, the proletariat will come into a conflict with the peasantry, thanks to Trotsky's theory. And therefore, it could not win, win against the majority of the population, the peasantry, unless there was a European-wide revolution, not revolution just in one country, Germany, but in every capitalist country. And the victorious private, the victorious proletarian uh, of the West would come with armed force to help the Russian proletariat, which by now, thanks to Trotsky theory, would be in tr trouble and would thus complete the revolution and make the temporary seizure of power into a permanent revolution. This convoluted theory he called, you know, theory of permanent revolution. But as a matter of fact, it's a theory of permanent hopelessness. Because nowhere in the world up to now has there been a simultaneous revolution in all the advanced capitalist countries. In fact, there hasn't been a revolution in an advanced capitalist country at all. The question is, should the proletariat, if the opportunity arises, take the opportunity of seizing power and develop, developing socialism? In one of his letters to Boris Suvaran, Lenin was asked the question, but the proletariat is very small in your country. Can you build socialism? Lenin said, tell me in which book, which Marx and Engels have stated that if the proletariat is in a minority, it cannot build socialism. Why not do the other way around? We gain power and we help to build industry and create a proletariat and build socialism on the basis of it precisely what happened. Because this theory went to get Trotsky's theory of permanent hopelessness, Trotsky could have said, life has proven me wrong, and I shall therefore follow Lenin and work for the building of socialism. Oh no, if the life does proves him to be wrong, then life must be wrong. The theory is correct, and that everybody must change, change their viewpoint. So that's the theory of permanent revolution. Secondly, is the um, attitude towards the peasantry that's connect, connected with it. You cannot have a revolution in a country with the peasantry, the majority, without carrying the majority of the peasantry, especially the poor peasantry, 
with you and make an ally of it. Trotsky would not trust the peasantry because they owned small plot, plots of land, land. So Trotsky had no allies, no bourgeoisie, no, no, no peasantry. So where is the revolution going to be made? It cannot be made in a country which is overwhelmingly full of the pe peasant masses. Then thirdly was his attitude towards the party building. When Lenin was trying to build the party of the proletariat, the Bolshevik party, Trotsky was busy combining with anybody to frustrate that happen, that, 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 that taking place. Caleb has already mentioned the August block. Now that comes in 1912, but long before 1912, Trotsky had done everything possible to frustrate and thwart the attempt to build the party party of the proletariat. Our August block was an assemblage of Mensheviks, of, of a few followers of, of, of Trotsky, socialist revolutionaries, everybody who was opposed to the Bolsheviks, everybody who was opposed, opposed to Lenin. It was a party based on conciliation, conciliation with the wrong elements. And, that, and Lenin constantly chided Trotsky for being a chief conciliator and, and, and for being a di di diplomat rather than, rather than a proletarian politician. So it, Trotsky was to, com to complain that revolution was betrayed by Stalin. Well, if Trotsky had been in charge, there wouldn't have been a revolution. There'd be nothing to betray. So at least the revolution was made that somebody could come along and betray. But the fact of the matter is Trotsky who was involved in the betrayal. And then thirdly, his attitude toward the institutions and leadership of the party. In 1912, he writes a letter to the Menshevik in which he says that this professional manipulator of backward elements of the working class movement, namely Lenin, is at it again. And he bears, Leninism bears the seeds of his own destruction within itself. Having cited that quotation, Trotsky says, said, Lenin says, sorry, Stalin says at one of the Central Committee meeting, watch the language, comrades. This is Trotsky speaking about the great Lenin, whose, who, who, whose shoelaces he was not worthy of time. If that's what he spoke about the great Lenin, what is Stalin? I'm an insignificant character. I'm a devout follower of Le 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 Lenin. I expect nothing better. That is how it should be. In fact, praise from Trotsky for me would be offensive. It would mean there's something ter terribly, terribly wrong with me. So these, these were the three themes of Trotsky and he never departed from them. Nobody would have heard such abuse, such unspeakable abuse that Trotsky heard for 13, 14 years, years against Lenin and then against Stalin throughout, throughout his life. He is the bureaucrat, he is, he is leading the party in the direction of capitalist restoration. He is somebody under whom the party is degenerating. That was, was, was to be his thing for the rest of his life. He was basically an attitudinizing proposer who was very upset that he hadn't been chosen to succeed then. And he couldn't be chosen because Track record was so bad. There's a French Trotskyite, I don't know whether he's still alive, called Pierre Brewer. And he says in one of his books, where he actually exposes Trotsky to be a Menshevik. But he said that was a good thing, because Trotsky could speak to everybody. He could conciliate different, 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 different uh, factions, if, if you like. And then he goes on to say, if Trotsky had not left the Bolshevik party, he would definitely have been chosen as a successor to Lenin. Well, pigs, pigs might fly. Well, of course, if he had left the Bolsheviks and followed their line, he probably would have, would have been chosen. But that wasn't the case. The party knew very well. And when big debates took place between Trotsky and, and the party, in the final debate, a vote was taken. The party headed by Stalin had three quarters of a million votes, and Trotsky's lot had 4,000 votes. Now you can judge from there what influence he had 
on the Russian working class. And Stalin said, Trotskyism has come to such a pass because Trotskyism has for long been trying to substitute Trotskyism for Leninism. The party doesn't want that. The party wants to follow the Leninist line and Trotsky wants to improve Leninism. He wants to, by bit by bit, actually to substitute Trots Trotsky, Trots Trotskyism is, is, is for Lenin. And that's why he suffered. It's not because of his lack of oratorical skills, because he had plenty of them. It is not because of his skill at self-emotion. He had plenty of that. It's not because of his ability for self-advertisement. He had all those qualities, and yet he came to nothing. As Stalin said, it's not a question of what skills you have. Plekhanov at one time was the leader of our party. And what's more, he was the founder of our party. What is more, he was highly respected. He had far greater respect among the masses than Trotsky ever, ever could have. But once Plekhanov turned away from Marxism towards opportunism, the masses turned their back on him. And precisely for that reason, the Russian communists turned their back on Trotsky because Trotsky turned away from Marxism. So that's it. Really Thanks, Sir Paul. You know, again, the thing that comes out about Trotsky, the individual, is really his 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 petty bourgeois individualism. You know, his absolute inability to let the truth um, be stronger than his ego. You know, so you can't change your mind about your ideas, even when your ideas have been proven wrong over and over again in the crucible of real life and practice. And this absolute inability to be a disciplined cog in the machine. He was all in favor of other people being cogs in a machine as long as he was in charge of it. But he definitely had that petty bourgeois mindset of the rules are for other people, the little people, you know, and I'm a big person and therefore the rules don't apply to me. And you can see, therefore, uh, just on that basis, never mind the fact that, you know, his theories fit nicely with a lot of imperialist and petty bourgeois prejudice. You know, you can see how, as an individual, he appeals to petty bourgeois intellectuals in the West. Caleb. Well, speaking of that, um, you know, one thing that is just a strong argument against Trotsky that gets routinely ignored. Uh, he wrote this book, which is called Stalin, an appraisal of the man and his influence by Leon Trotsky. The first chapter of the book uh, argues that Stalin, Stalin's flaws are rooted in the fact that he's, quote, Asiatic and that he's not European, right? Um, I mean, and that's the first chapter. I mean, it just starts out talking about how Stalin is from Georgia. Stalin's not a Western. He doesn't have the Western understanding. He's got this Asiatic mindset. So that's kind of that kind of shows you you know, the basis of, of Trotskyism. And, and again, he's in love with the West, and then he baits Stalin over being quote unquote Asiatic. Um, so, so that's one thing that, you know, when you talk about Trotsky being, uh, you know, undisciplined and such, I think the Brest Litovsk incident uh, is very telling, right? That after the Russian revolution, the Bolsheviks had taken power on a platform of we will end the war. We will pull Russia out of World War One, And Trotsky and a lot of other Bolshevik leaders said, well, now that the Bolsheviks have taken power, it's a revolutionary war. Uh, it's not a, um, it's not an imperialist war, so we can continue fighting because we're we're fighting for socialism. And Lenin says, well, no, we took power on a platform of we will end the war. We have to end the war. And Trotsky was the foreign minister of the Soviet Union. So he was sent to meet with the Germans to sign a treaty to end the war. And he didn't do it. Right. And instead, he made a big point of uh, of arguing with the Germans about issues that had nothing to do with signing the treaty. And he went to go meet with the Germans. And for days he met with them and he did not sign the treaty. And he came back with no treaty. And even though he'd been sent to sign a treaty and he came back with this position that they would have no war, but no peace, meaning they would never sign a treaty with the Germans, but they would demobilize the fighting. And it would be almost like they had no war. And it was an outrageous position. And Lenin threatened to resign unless they went back and signed the treaty. And ultimately, uh, they did sign the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. And then Trotsky uh, stepped down as the foreign minister because that incident was such an embarrassment. That was a moment where people were dying on the battlefield. They needed to sign a treaty 
Uh, but Trotsky, in the name of being theatrical and and performative and adopting his theories of permanent revolution or whatever, he he wouldn't sign the treaty. And I think that that stands out. But the other thing that I point out about Trotsky, which is interesting, is in his autobiography, and according to Isaac Deutscher and others, his mentor, the person he was the closest to, was Alexander Parvis. And Alexander Parvis was born in Russia, uh, and he was a, a Marxist who then moved to Germany, became a German citizen, was elected to the German parliament, uh, and Alexander Parvis was, we now know, a German secret police agent. He was running with the German intelligence agencies. And that he, Trotsky, is Trotsky attributes his theory of permanent revolution to Alexander Parvis. So a, a German intelligence officer is the author of Trotsky's primary theory. That should ring some pretty huge bells. Now, Alexander Parvis also approached Lenin when Lenin was living in exile in Switzerland and arranged for Lenin to return to Russia because the Germans, you know, they, they wanted to pull Russia out of World War I, et cetera. But the fact that Alexander Parvis, you know, this, this, this German intelligence officer is the author of the theory of permanent revolution, according to Trotsky himself, that is somewhat alarming. The other thing is that prior to the Russian Revolution, the main one of the main things that Trotsky did was he went around agitating for the United States of Europe or the European Union. Uh, and in Lenin's very important essay, Imperialism and the Split in Socialism, Lenin says, we don't want to create a European Union. We don't want to create a United States of Europe because that would strengthen imperialism, to have all the imperialists combine all their strength into one government. That would lead to further exploitation of the third world that would strengthen imperialism. But Trotsky was in favor of creating a United States of Europe because he said, well, that would break down national barriers and the workers of different nationalities would come together. Um, and I think that's rather important now in light of the fact that there is a European Union uh, that has come into existence, that has been a disaster for the working class of, of Europe. And Trotsky was and Lenin was against it uh, from the beginning. So there you go. Definitely. Thanks, Caleb. Um, if it's all right, we'll talk a little bit now about Trotskyism. So, you know, Trotsky in his lifetime lived to see all of his theories disproven in life. Uh, Stalin became the beloved hero of the whole uh, you know, mass of the world's population, all the national liberation struggles, all of the working class people of the world looked to Stalin's Soviet Union for leadership and guidance and trusted and, and loved the leadership of the Soviet Union for the support it gave them and the great leadership it gave them and the, and the incredible job that uh, the Bolsheviks under Stalin had done of building the Soviet Union, defeating fascism, all of the things that it did. All of Trotsky's predictions were, were disproved and Trotsky himself ended his life ignominiously uh, in Mexico. But something happened after World War II to resurrect Trotsky and Trotskyism, um, which otherwise, to be honest with you, I think would have quietly died a death, you know, there and then at the end of World War II. Um, so, Harpal, do you want to talk a little bit about how Trotskyism was um, resuscitated in the 1950s? Yes, I, yes, I do. I mean, what came to the rescue of Trotsky were two things. He was very fortunate enough to have been the victim of one of his former comrades who came with a well-made alpine axe and chopped his neck, neck off in Mexico, Mexico. So the guy who dies is suddenly rescued. His reputation is somewhat rehabilitated because every field, but he feels sympathy, particularly when mischievously you can pin down his murder to Stalin, because Stalin must be afraid of this, this man that he is in 1940, done to death. But of course, our, since we're jumping to after the Second World War, basically after 1956, is the triumph of Christophe revisionism in the Soviet Union. Khrushchev in his speech of February 1956, defamed Stalin in the most outrageous terms. They were all lies. They were all lies. We have said that for years. And recently, Grover Ferb, the American academic, came up with the book, Christopher Lied. So he says, every one of the assertions made by Christopher was, 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 was a lie. So Christopher is the one 
who restored Trotsky's reputation, not directly because he didn't have the courage to do that, but people said, he's saying all those things that Trotsky used to say. It's the general secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union who's saying that. So that gave a certain amount of credence and, and to, 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 to the to Trotskyites, but it's, it's very, very thin. But unfortunately, it's taken a long time for, 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 for it to wear, wear thin, because not only has Khrushchev's policy uh, led to the collapse of the Soviet Union, but Trotskyism itself, which could not exist without the Soviet Union, is, is going down because they actually lived their life just for the purpose of attacking the Soviet Union. Once the Soviet Union is no more, they really are punching in the air, air as it were. It just doesn't work. People are not interested in their vociferations against Stalin. And Stalin, in fact, is proving correct with each passing day. You only have to look at Russia today, what exactly is happening and how important people think Stalin was and what his great, 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 great contribution was. But one thing that I want to say, people will tell you that Trotsky and Trotskyism were not fighting against Leninism, but against Stalinism. But Stalin proved it conclusively that the fight that the Trotskyites were waging was the way first against Lenin, but after the October Revolution, it became a da dangerous thing to attack Leninism directly. So they were continuing that fight against Len Leninism, the ideology of Marxism and Leninism through attacking Stalin. It was continued for the same fight. And the fight that the party, Bolshevik party was waging against Trotskyism was a continuation of the same fight it has waged against Trotskyism during the period of Stalin's life. So this is extremely important to understand. Thank you, Papal. You know, um, the things from my experience of mixing with Trotsky organisations, of which there are a plethora in Britain, which, as you say, used to be much bigger and stronger and, and everywhere in the streets and now have receded significantly um, uh, when it comes to a street presence anyway. Um, but certain things stood out to me, and Caleb, maybe you can comment on some of these. One is that um, it's very much a Western ideology that, that works really only in the imperialist countries because it wraps up propaganda, which is actually acceptable to the ruling class, anti-national liberation struggles, anti the USSR in revolutionary language, which sits well with a certain section of the population, especially students and intellectuals, right? To, to, to seem radical and revolutionary while actually not threatening any of the prejudices you've been brought up with, uh, by living in an imperialist country, right? Um, and the other thing is, you know, increasingly, I get the impression that the whole Trotskyist project and movement in the West has been significantly sponsored by the secret services as a tactic to divide and confuse the working class about what Leninism is. Because what you find is, so you look at the tactics of the Bolsheviks that were so successful, right? And we try to replicate those, right? But one of the things that really gets in the way between us trying to connect our Marxism with the masses of the working class is the number of fake Marxist, fake Leninist organizations which are out there. There seems to be a thousand of tiny little splinter Trotskyist organizations, all with a paper that has a very radical Bolshevik sounding name, right? They take the terminology of Lenin and the Bolsheviks and they wrap themselves up in it and they stick their papers in the face of everybody. So yours is one of, you know, kind of 20 or 30 on offer to working people and they end up and, and their sellers are very aggressive and shouty and they, workers end up going, oh, not none of this Marxist newspaper stuff for me, thank you. You know, and the people who do want to find a good Marxist newspaper, they've got to wade through all this rubbish to find the one that's that's worth looking for. And of course, lots of people simply give up because a lot of the ones they'll come across accidentally uh, or just, you know, in the course of looking will be full of rubbish that will put them off. Right. So, um, I'd like you to, to, to talk a little bit about that, the role that Trotskyism plays in the working class movement. Well, 
Who's it, me or Caleb? Caleb, sorry, Caleb. Oh, oh, it's me. Okay. Um, well, you know, it's it's interesting. Um, you know, when you say that about about how it's been intentionally fomented, uh, I believe Joseph Goebbels, the Nazi propagandist, in his uh, diaries, he mentioned that the Nazis during World War II. Uh, had two different uh, propaganda broadcasts into Soviet Russia. One was a Russian nationalist and czarist broadcast against the Soviet Union, and the other was a Trotskyist one. Um, and this is in his diary. He admits they had a Trotskyist uh, radio program that they were broadcasting into the Soviet Union to cause confusion and dissent during the Second World War. The other thing that's interesting, and I've pointed to this before, is that uh, there's an individual that now has just been, you know, forgotten by history named Otto Strasser. And Otto Strasser was a founder of the Nazi party who had a falling out with Hitler uh, and fled to Britain. And from Britain during World War II, he did broadcasts about how he was the true Nazi. And Hitler uh, had uh, Hitler had abandoned Nazism. And the British government promoted him, and 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 after World War II, he was able to set up shop, and he was legally allowed to exist as kind of a uh, a Nazi who was against Hitler, you know, and it just kind of faded into nothing. But it showed that that was a propaganda tactic that was used, right? That that because the British were fighting the Nazis, they created uh, the true Nazi. And if you look at that, you can understand that Trotskyism serves an intelligence purpose as a movement, right? The idea of of uh, instead of instead of just saying that Stalin and communism is completely wrong, uh, let's find uh, somebody who had a falling out with Stalin to say that he's the true communist and pro project his ideas. It makes sense that that would serve a propaganda tactic. The Nazis did this, and it, it seems like the West did that with uh, with Trotsky as as well. The, the other thing that's that's very interesting about Trotskyism um, is that in the lead up to the Second World War, uh, you see every political movement uh, in in the Western world dividing, basically on the question of what side are you on. In the United States, the Communist Party. They're on the side of, of Roosevelt, who they're in alliance with against fascism and the, the People's Front, uh, you know, and they're admiring the Soviet Union and Stalin. Uh, and and a lot of the social democratic leaders that are on Roosevelt's side, et cetera, et cetera, are starting to say good things about the Soviet Union because they're anticipating the war is coming and they're on the side of the Soviet Union against the Nazis. And there's kind of a pretty clear divide. Whereas the enemies of Roosevelt, the National Association of Manufacturers and others, they're sympathizing with the Nazis. They're seeing Roosevelt as a dirty communist who is aligned with Stalin. And there's a clear polarization. I know in Britain, you had a guy named Oswald Mosley. And Oswald Mosley was a, a fascist, right? And he was a, a fa faction of the bourgeoisie in Britain that was sympathetic with fascism. Um, and in Britain, you had the Communist Party and people in the Labour Party and other people that were very against Oswald Mosley because they saw him as aligning with fascism. In the United States, among the Black Liberation Movement, there was a big divide because unfortunately, there were many Black leaders that, that saw Britain as the main enemy and were somewhat sympathetic to fascism. You had the Nation of Islam and others that that saw, you know, Rose Roosevelt as, as an enemy. And so, so you had a divide. And in response to the Nation of Islam, which was the main black nationalist group in the United States that was somewhat sympathetic to the Axis powers, you had the rise of a guy named Father Divine. And Father Divine was a black minister, a black liberation leader who was supportive of the Soviet Union and supportive of Roosevelt. And so if you if you understand that context of every political movement is dividing in the lead up to World War II in the Western countries, are you for the Axis powers or are you for are you for the Popular Front and and the Soviet Union? Uh, if you see that the role of Trotskyism is particularly obvious as serving the Axis powers uh, because Trotsky was playing the role of the Trotskyites, the Fourth International. They were the people in the labor movement and they were the people speaking in the name of socialism that were against, were against Stalin and that were trying to undermine the popular front against fascism. So the idea that Trotsky was an agent of the Nazis or Trotsky was serving fascism, it makes sense given that context. He was playing the role of trying to take apart the alliance between Roosevelt and the Communist Party USA, trying to take apart uh, the popular front anti-fascist alliance that the Communist Party was building. Um, and if you look at it that way, uh, the idea that, that the Trotskyites could have been serving fascism 
uh, maybe not consciously, but I guess Grover Fur argues that that it was definitely conscious. But but even unconsciously, that's the role they were playing. The word fifth column, which used to be a much more commonly used term, uh, it comes out of the Spanish Civil War, and that that in the Spanish Civil War, when the fascists were trying to seize Madrid. Uh, they said, uh, you know, Franco said, well, I have four columns outside the city and then I have a fifth column inside the city. And what he was referring to was the Trotskyites because he was covertly giving aid and sponsorship to the Trotskyites in Spain that were trying to undermine the Spanish Republic that what the Communist Party was supporting in an alliance against fascism. Um, and that Trotskyism was a fifth column. It, it spoke in the name of socialism. Uh, but it was trying to undermine the anti-fascist coalition that the communists were building. Um, and what I think is also interesting is that Trotskyism, especially in the United States, it never really built a mass following among the labor movement. Uh, it never had a big following among the masses. It was always among the intellectuals. Um, and that they played on, I think we can understand there was a weakness on the part of the communist party that that it was very much a party of, of very desperate, poor, unemployed people and people in the labor unions who were trying to get stuff done. And they built amazing unemployed demonstrations and they mobilized the labor movement. They had the general strikes of 1934 and they, they did amazing things. But in order to do those amazing things, you know, when an army is marching into battle, there's not room for debate. Uh, you know, you have to just go and do it. And the Trotskyites uh, very effectively kind of played on, on, that uh, and the fact that the Communist Party was very effective in getting things done and wasn't debating things to kind of, you know, siphon off intellectuals who might have been put off by that environment um, and that they played the role of, of kind of playing on the frustrations of intellectuals who felt that the Communist Party wasn't, you know, it didn't have uh, the, the enough of a debate. It didn't have enough of an intellectual depth to it. Uh, and that the Trotskyism was a way to siphon intellectuals who, who, and many intellectuals were supporting and becoming sympathetic with the Soviet Union in these years, but it was a way to, to give revolutionaries, uh, or to give intellectuals a way out. They could see themselves as revolutionary, but be against the Soviet Union. And it's important to add that the, the Trotskyite intellectuals of the late 1930s, Almost all of them became neoconservatives later. And neoconservatism, the Bush administration, the ideology of the, the Republican Party in the late years of the Cold War, in the Reagan years, uh, in the Bush years, uh, many of the leading voices, such as Irving Kristol, uh, Jean Kirkpatrick, who was the UN, uh, UN representative, I believe she was the, the UN ambassador, uh, you know, many of these people uh, were former Trotskyites. Um, uh, Paul Wolfowitz, I believe, was a former Trotskyite as well. And that that many of these Trotskyites, they were against the Soviet Union. And then that led them to become big advocates of imperialism uh, and and full on anti-communists uh, and and conservatives uh, during the Cold War years. Uh, and that there is a continuity if you read their writing. Right. If you read Irving Kristol and his writing, there's a continuity between being a Trotskyite and and becoming a neoconservative. Uh, one of the things that he says in his his autobiography about why he became a conservative is he said he was a Trotskyite and then he got drafted into the U.S. military during World War II. And he said, I'd written about the working class, but I'd never met them before. And I met them and I thought they were awful. Right. And that, you know, and I said, I, I can't build socialism with these people. They're they're inferior. And I realized I was an intellectual for a reason. And these workers were were workers for a reason and that people have different roles and that the intellectuals need to rule over other people. I mean, there's blatant elitism that comes across. Right. And that part of neoconservatism is the noble lie, the idea that that politics is just too complicated. For the broad masses of people to understand. So we need these smart intellectuals to just kind of manipulate things and maneuver behind the scenes. And Leo Strauss and Irving Kristol, they have this elitism that, that they went from Trotskyism to neoconservatism with this view that, that the working class is dangerous and backward. And equating Stalin with Nazi Germany is a really big part of their, their mindset also. That, that's that Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union are both an expression of, of populism, of, of, of the rabble, the inferior working class rabble getting together and persecuting the intellectuals. And what's great about the West 
in theory is that we we protect the intellectuals. The intellectuals are safe in the West. We're protected, and and we have to we have checks to make sure that the masses of people don't ever rise up and start threatening the great philosopher kings in the Platonic sense. That's the neoconservative ideology, but it flows from the Trotskyite mentality in a lot of ways. Beautiful, thanks, Caleb. Before I come back to you, Hapal, just wanted to put in my sort of two cents worth regarding my personal experience of mixing with Trotskyites in Britain, uh, very much hinges around anti-war work and national liberation solidarity work, right? So all my life, you know, the big struggles I was engaged in tended to have this at the core, right? There was the uh, solidarity with the Irish armed struggle. There was solidarity with Palestine, which is it keeps coming back around, obviously. Um, there was the question of the wars in, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in Libya, in Syria, uh, and the fermenting of war against Russia, China, Iran, DPRK. And in every single one of those um, struggles, I found myself opposite to Trotskyists. Suppose, you know, so you go to back in the days when Stop the War was a big mass movement, which, you know, they frittered it into nothing. But there was a time when it was a big mass movement and its meetings would attract a lot of people. And they would always be packed. You know, the, the, the platform would be controlled by a kind of lash up between revisionist communists and Trotskyites and they would control who was invited to speak and they would pack the audience with their people who would they would pick on to speak, right? And I remember regularly we'd go to a, a meeting that was about, you know, the war in uh, Iraq and they would promote to us, you know, um, Iraqi trade unionists and communists who had been brought back to Iraq by the occupation forces, right, as sort of heroes. Or we would go to a, a meeting about the war in Syria to be told by the Trotskyists there, oh, don't you know there's a revolution happening in Syria? There are people's councils being set up against Bashar al-Assad's government. Don't you know? Don't you know it's a popular uprising? And by the way, something similar is about to happen in Iran. We must support the people's councils in Iran. We must support the people's councils in Libya. We must support the people's councils in Syria. All of the Now, not only were these people's councils a total fictitious mirage of the fervid Trotskyite imagination, I've never heard a Trotskyite apologize for the fact that that was a lie and a delusion, a, a, you know, a lie at worst, a delusion at best, right? I never heard them go back on that propaganda. They never take it back, but they always bring it out. When imperialism's getting ready to make war against a country of its choice, the Trotskyites, on the one hand, they'll say, oh, war isn't very nice, so we must oppose war. And then they will go on to not only repeat the imperialist propaganda, but embellish it and give it kind of working class credentials. And their complaint ends up being that our ruling class doesn't go far enough against the evil oppressors of the people in the targeted country. So, you know, their complaints against Saddam Hussein or uh, Robert Mugabe or Kim Jong-un or whoever it might be are like more rabid than the imperialist ones. So, Hapal, I wonder if you could explain where that comes from. Well, can I say something? Can I say something? Can I jump in? I, I just to echo what you said. Um, I remember at the found at, at, during the Arab Spring in 2011, uh, the United National Anti-War Coalition of the United States (UNAC) had a meeting, and I was at that meeting. And a, a, a very prominent Trotskyite author got up and spoke, and this was during the Arab Spring, and it was about you know the Egyptian Revolution had just happened, and his entire speech was about how amazing the Arab Spring was and how it was going to lead to amazing places because the Soviet Union didn't exist anymore. And he said that, uh, you know, you know, if the Soviet Union still existed, uh, all of these all of these uprisings would be co-opted and taken over by Stalinism. But now the Arab Spring is going to lead to amazing places because, you know, the Soviet Union doesn't exist anymore. And I wish I could find an, a recording of that speech, because if you look at the Arab Spring, what was the result in Syria, in Libya, in Egypt, even everywhere the Arab Spring uprisings happened? Without the Soviet Union there, what was the result? And it was just he couldn't have been more opposite of, of correct. And his whole speech was just it was so great that these uprisings were happening with no Soviet Union there to mess them up. So I just had to add that. So thanks, Caleb. Purpal. Well, I'm an old fashioned Marxist. I take it down all to theoretical thinking. 
all Trotsky's misfortunes flow from his theory of permanent revolution. Because the theory of permanent revolution proved wrong in case of the Russian, Russian Revolution, it proved wrong with every single other revolution. Trotskyism could have changed and said, that's it. It's not a correct theory. But Trotskyism stuck to it. And the result of that was that he went from bad to worse, from being an upholder of an erroneous theory, he actually ends up on the side of those who want to demolish the Bolshevik party, who want to demolish the Soviet Union, who actually ends up in the final analysis, an agent and an ally of German and Japanese, Japanese fascism. That's the, the trajectory of travel of, of, of Trotskyism. Trotskyism was so useful to imperialism that newspapers published by the Hearst Press, one of the most important platforms of the imperialist lie, 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 lie machine, regularly came up with articles how this great revolutionary Trotsky has exposed how Stalin betrayed the revolution. It is as though the Hearst Press and the American bourgeoisie were so concerned, so favorable to the proletarian revolution that they couldn't bear to see Stalin destroyed the, 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 this, this revolu revolution. That's just one example of the two sides meeting, Trotskyism and in, in, imperialist, imperialist bourgeoisie. And Trotskyism, Stalin asked the question, Trotsky with such stock and trade, how did he end up in the Bolshevik party? And he says, it ended up in the Bolshevik party because at the time Trotsky joined the Bolshevik party, first of all, he came as an individual. He had no meaningful group. He was part of a small group called the Interregional Group. And they had all declared that all their differences with Bolshevism had ceased and they joined the Bolshevik party. And most of them became gen gen genuine, genuine revolutionaries. Trotsky jo jo joined, joined, joined with them. And Stalin said, during that period, he hid his stock in trade. He hid the theory of permanent revolution. He really did give, give it up. That's why he was able to play an important revolution, revolutionary role during those few years. But had he not done that, he would certainly have lost all influence on the revolutionary devel development, de devel development in, in Russia. But already before Lenin died, he started his old stock and trade again. At one time, it may be difficult for you to believe, Buk Bukharin was a left, left communist. Bukharin and Trotsky joined in opposing the Bolshevik policy signing the brest litovsk treaty, treaty, treaty. Trotsky posed, he spent day, days and days in brest litovsk giving le lectures to the German high command about the revolutionary movement of the Western country. So the German generals simply closed their eyes, put their feet on the table and let Trotsky bark away. And as Caleb has rightly said, he then left the meeting without signing the, the brest litovsk Treaty, but also announcing that the Soviet Union or the, or the Russian Republic was going to demobilize de and not continue the, with the war. The fact of the matter is Lenin wasn't asking for this treaty to be signed because he liked the treaty. It was because at that time, there was no Russian army that was willing and capable of fighting. You don't fight without armies. Trotsky can be a one, one man army, one man general, but not realistic people like Lenin and Stalin. So in the end, after he done that, the, the Germans made a sweep and they took far greater amount of territory than had been initially agreed to be signed away Way to the to, 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 to the to the Germans, and Lenin, Lenin said later on, even even a fool can understand.
that this treaty should have should, should have been signed. The fool was, of course, sitting few few meet meters away from him at, at a Barcher Park Ready meeting. Then he launched another sortie in the middle of the most difficult condition, and that sortie was on the question of trade unions. What should be the role of the trade unions in the Soviet Union? I'd invite you to read Lenin's two articles, very important ones, trade, trade, trade unions and the mystics of Comrade Trotsky and Bukharin, and another one, once again on the trade unions and the mystics of Comrade Trotsky and Comrade, Comrade Bukharin. They wanted this so-called dem Democrat fighting against Stalinist bureaucracy, wanted the trade unions to become state organs and do whatever the government of the Russian Republic said. Then said, you can't. Trade unions have their own interests. The trade union leadership must protect the interests of working, working people. He was be beaten on that. And then it carries on. Every time there's a problem, every time the Soviet Union is in difficulty internally or its situation worsens in the international sphere, Trotskyites launch another sortie of the Bolshevik party. For example, the 1926 general strike was defeated. Wasn't defeated because of Stalin, wasn't defeated because of the Soviet Union. It was defeated because the Labour Party and trade union leadership betrayed, betrayed that, 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 that strike. But the Trotskyites pinned it on Stalin that the Soviet Union hadn't given them good advice, that the Soviet Union hadn't given them support. That dies down, and a couple of years later comes the question of Chinese revolution. Chinese revolution suffers serious defeats at the hands of Chiang Kai-shek. Again, Trotskyites pin the blame on, on, on Stalin. You ought to read my big, big article in my book on Trotskyism and Leninism on the question, question of, of, of the Chinese revolution. So every time there's a problem, they pin the blame on the Soviet Union. At the same time, if the Soviet Union does anything to defend its position against internal and external enemies, they accuse the Soviet Union of using foreign parties as tools of Stalin policy, Stalinist policy. And as Stalin said, what would the international revolution be without the Soviet Union? You know, what would it be if the Soviet Union uh, did not exist? Soviet Union supports other people and it gains the support of other people. That's the mutual help given by revolutionary proletarians all over, all over the world. And then, then, of course, having been beaten all over the place, when Trotsky was in favor of industrialization and collectivization in 1924 when the conditions for it did not exist. But as soon as industrialization takes place, as soon as collectivization takes place, he writes that collectivization should be stopped on the grounds that the state farms were not paying their way, on the ground that the, the collector farms were fake. They did not exist re really. Instead, he wanted the policy of restricting the exploitative, exploiting tendencies of the Kulux, the policy that party had pursued four, year, four years earlier, quite correct, correctly. On the question of industrialization, he wanted to stop the industrialization by saying that what we need is give big concessions to foreign capitalists to develop the Russian economy. But then, in the end, he writes a book, Revolution Betrayed. It has some fantastic paragraphs and quotations you should have. How, he says, the Soviet Union has made tremendous progress in industrialization and collectivization. If I remember correctly, I'm just uh, uh, reproducing that language of Trotsky in my own language. He said, the validity of Marxism is being proved not in the pages of Das Kapital, but in the industrial arena occupying one sixth of the Earth's space. And then he goes on to, to actually detail the achievements made by the Soviet Union in the field of industry, industrialization, 
in the field of agriculture, scientific advances, cultural achievements, and everything you can think of. And what's more, the great growth of Soviet patriotism, which is genuine, it's not made up by, by Stalin, Stalin or anybody. And yet, toward the end, he goes on to say the revolution has been betrayed. And there's such a dichotomy between thought and lang language that the more you build socialism, the more you're betraying the revolution. I, I meet Trotskyites in, in Britain, Britain today, and they call Stalin counter-revolutionary because he decided to build socialism in one country. Well, they don't have the courage. They're not st stupid. They're not totally ignorant. They don't have the courage to say that the author of that policy was Lenin. So if you must say that somebody was counter-revolutionary, bringing that theory of socialism in one country, you must, in all fairness, accuse Le Le Lenin. If Stalin is to be accused, and Stalin said, what has Stalin to do with it? He's speaking in the third person, said, Stalin had nothing to do with it. It's Comrade Lenin who is the arch architect of theory, and Lenin was absolutely right. And our practice is proving that, 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 that he, 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 he was right. So Trotskyism is actually a bundle, bundle of contradiction. Because if you, if you stick to an incorrect theory, the only way you can negotiate your way is through a bundle of contradictions. But as Plakhanov said, there are contradictions and contradictions. Some contradictions move society forward, and there are others that take it backwards. And all the contradictions of Trotskyism are, are for taking our society backwards. Beautiful. Thanks, Rapal. You know, I. Uh... I'm going to start to wrap up our conversation. I'll come back to both of you for final words, but I really feel like we've touched on so many things there that smash so many of the myths that are taught either to young people coming into the left-wing movement, um, uh, it's particularly if they end up in a Trotskyist organization or a revisionist one, um, or to just A-level history students, you know, anyone who takes a course in, in Russian history or, or Second World War history or any of those things, you know, are taught these lies uh, that were told by Trotsky and amplified massively through the Western press and then have become shibboleths of Western historiography, right? That they're just, everybody knows, everybody knows that Trotsky was right and Stalin was awful uh, and for all of these reasons. And, um, you know, we've touched on all the main ones here today, I think, so that's that's great. Uh, I just want to finish by, by pointing out that what I see today, the role that Trotskyism has ended up in, in the British working class movement, uh, is really is really twofold. The first is, like I touched on earlier, to kind of discredit real Marxism Leninism. Not no more to kind of drown it out, but to discredit it. It's like a caricature of real Bolshevism, the slogans that they shout and the way they shout them and the terminology they use. It discredits real Marxism, real Bolshevism, uh, real party building. Uh, and it makes, a, it makes a mockery of it, it, makes it look stupid and unattractive in the eyes of the masses. Uh, and that's a very useful role, as we said before, for, for the Western imperialist states, right? And the other thing I've noticed is as Trotskyism recedes, it's receding into the universities. The, you more, won't meet many Trotsky organizations on the street face to face anymore, not very often. But if you are studying in a university, there will be a Trotskyite-led Marxist society for studying Marxism and, you know, propagating Marxism, whatever. And really, I think this role, I think, is a particularly insidious and important one as far as, you know, insidious as far as our movement is concerned and important as far as the state is concerned, because, of course, radical intellectuals and radical students have always played a really important role in successful revolutions. And I don't think it's an accident that when the Trotsky Act movement is shrinking in on itself, where it, where it gravitates to is the universities to catch the revolutionary minded young people and make sure they don't end up in the arms of the real revolutionaries. So I'm going to hand over to Caleb for your last thoughts and then Papal. Well, I, I guess I'll say this. I just want to quickly uh, mention that, you know, among Trotskyite groups, you can divide them into three. There are three categories uh, at this point among Trotskyite groups that you'll see. The first is what you call neo Trotskyites uh, or third camp Trotskyites. And these are people, uh, it's mainly an academic campus based, you know, trend. And their critique of all the socialist and communist governments around the world is they're not democratic enough. 
they think the Soviet Union was was state capitalist. It was an evil state capitalist regime. And, you know, uh, they they are uh, obsessed with, you know, spreading, quote unquote, human rights around the world. And they're involved in NGO liberal activism. And they tend to be based on the campuses. They tend to really focus on the LGBT movement and things like that. That's called neo Trotskyism. The second current that you get is what you might call mainline Trotskyism. And in Britain, these are the folks that join the Labour Party. Uh, in the United States, we have a group called Socialist Alternative, uh, you know, that, that was big in supporting Bernie Sanders. And they, they'll claim to kind of support Cuba or kind of support uh, socialist countries, but they don't really support them. They'll say, well, they're socialist in foundation, but they want to overthrow the Stalinist bureaucracy. And they're obsessed with labor unions and they want to build labor unions. They'll talk about economics. They're on the wrong side internationally, but they're very in interested in labor unions and economic struggles. And then you have a third category of people that they talk call orthodox Trotskyists. And these are Trotskyists that I jokingly say, these are Trotskyists that are just nuts. Uh, they're, you know, I mean, these are Trotskyists who will say things like World War II is still happening because Trotsky said World War II can only end with global revolution. So it clearly must be happening still because Trotsky said, you know, they'll, they'll, there's there's some of them that believe in UFOs and space aliens. Uh, you know, there's some of them that want to legalize pedophilia and will go to great lengths arguing about why child rape should be legalized because of something that Trotsky said or Lenin said, you know, these, these you know, but to the credit of some of these weird, you know, orthodox Trotskyists, some of them will actually take stances that are against U.S. imperialism because they're nuts. They're so hyper sectarian and crazy. Some of them do support Russia and Ukraine. Some of them will defend the DPRK a little bit or something like that. But they're they're you know, they're they're a very obscure, you know, even more obscure wing of things. But those are the three camps of, of Trotskyism that you'll see. You'll see they, they divide into those three categories. But what brings them all together? And I think this is what I would like to end my contribution today with. What is the essence of Trotskyism? It's that when Lenin developed his theories, he said that the main danger to humanity is imperialism, is capitalism has become imperialism, a global system of monopoly capitalism that is holding back development and impoverishing people all over the world. And the duty of revolutionaries is to oppose imperialism. And Trotskyism, all of its different manifestations and interpretations is always an attempt to say, no, no, it's not about fighting the imperialists. It's about fighting for pure workers' democracy. It's about fighting the Stalinist bureaucracy. It's about, you know, you know, this, you know, it's about this, it's about that. It's never a fight against the imperialists, right? Trotskyism is a way that you can claim to be a Marxist or a socialist or a revolutionary, but not focus on fighting the imperialists, fight some other battle, but not against imperialism. That is the essence of what Trotskyism is. Beautiful. Thank you, Caleb. And of course, that explains why Trotskyism is so anti-Leninist, right? Her pile. Yeah, there's two, three points, comrades. Uh, first of all, there is not a single socialist revolution or a single genuine revolutionary national liberation struggle that the Trotskyites have wholeheartedly and genuinely su su supported. There might be the odd group that does it and stands out on, on its own, but they, they do not. And they do not because it follows from the theory of permanent revolution. The revolution can only come in advanced countries. That too, if it comes all together simultaneously. And they do not recognize national liberation struggles. During the time that Lenin was fighting for years to have in the party program of the Bolshevik party, the clause about supporting the national liberation struggles of the people subjugated by Tsarism and other countries, the Trotskyites opposed it as indeed the unfortunately Rosa Luxemburg. During the Vietnam struggle, we were in the movement. The Trotskyites could not ignore the struggle. The Vietnamese were kicking, to use Scott Richard's term, kicking the American butt. So people were enthused everywhere. So they couldn't keep away, but they brought dissension within the working class movement. While our slogan was, victory to the National Liberation Front in South Vietnam. Theirs was the Ho Chi Minh is a Stalinist bureaucrat. He executed a number of, of, of Trotskyites in Vietnam. And my retort was not, not, not enough. And he should be commended for executing some, but leaving some, some others behind. The second point that I, I'd like to make is that as far as uh, Trotskyism is concerned, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, 
apart from maybe one or two, there's hardly a Trotsky organization, a party, a group that did not wholeheartedly and ecstatically welcome the counter-revolution in the Soviet Union. Everyone in Britain, for example, the SWP, the, work, the Workers' Party, uh, you know, the Workers' Revolutionary Party, and myriads of other small groups, they all said, socialism, communism is dead. Let's now fight for socialism. That was the slogan of the largest Trotsky organization, na namely the, um, the, 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 the Socialist Workers' work, work Party. They are on the side of counter-revolution. These dim dimwits first welcome the, the revolution. They say go, go, Gorbachev and Yeltsin are trying to start fight for the revolution that Trotsky was fighting for. Well, within a few months, it was clear that they were attacking the working class. And then they can start complaining that the working class being attacked. Could you not have known that you bloody dimwits? No, they, no, they, no, 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 they could, couldn't. The only thing I want to say is Trotskyism has quite a few supporters, as Jyoti said, in the academia. And our job, literally our motto should, in the communist movement should be to bury Trotskyism forever. I've written a book on Trotskyism and Leninism. Not, I don't make no any, any money out of it, selling lit, lit, literature or writing books. I hope people will read. But since it's a big book, not many people read it. And I'm trying to persuade my party comrades to just produce the preface that I wrote to it, which is a long 60, 70 page preface. And we, we want to do that so we can give it to workers and young intellectuals and students so that they can, in a summary form, form get to know what, what Trotskyism is. And if we can make that small contribution, we are doing very, very well. You know, yes, the fight is against imperialism, but it can't be conducted without fighting against opportunism, without fighting against the agents of imperialism in the working class movement, one of whom, one of whom ends with the Trot Trotskyist movement. Thank you so very much. Perfect. I think we can end there. All right. Thank you.